uh, it's so great to be here in Seattle to chat about my new book. Um, I'm a law professor, so uh, I typically write law review articles as scholarship, and then I publish them, and I kind of hope someone finds them. And I got to write this book, and I was very careful and, and purposeful of writing it for the general public. And um, it's really great to not only publish it, but then get to go around the country and speak with people about some of these ideas. Um, it's also special to be here in Seattle. Uh, 19 years ago, my then girlfriend and I randomly came to Seattle for three months in the summer and fell in love with the place and thought, you know, what a great place to be as, a, as young college students. Amazingly, she married me. And, uh, and now we're back together here in Seattle to explore a little bit. Uh, we're going to go to a Mariners game tomorrow night, so hopefully they'll win. Uh, and probably get some coffee. So uh, it's great to be here in Seattle uh, to, to speak about this. This is actually the end of our West Coast tour. We, uh, we've been touring for about two and a half weeks, started in San Diego and drove all the way up with our two kids uh, who are in the children's section, I believe. So uh, they care about voting too, but they're just a little bit too young to do that. Um, so this book is a little bit different for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, as I said, it's written really for the general public, and I hope that uh, people find it really readable. Someone actually told me they thought it was a good beach read, and I said, you know, a book about voting is a beach read. That's, that's got to be a success. Uh, and the second thing I, I reason is different is it's about voting rights, and yet it's positive. It's optimistic. And you might say to yourself, right, you know, and people, when I, when I talk to them, uh, and, and I say, I wrote a book about voting rights, and uh, it's a positive book, they say, wow, it must be a really short read. And, you know, I, it's not actually. There's actually a lot of good news out there. But let me start with a little bit of the bad, because every time I say something about voting rights, uh, I tend to hear doom and gloom, right? Voter suppression is taking over. It's harder to participate. Our elections are less democratic. Maybe I'll use the R word, right? It's rigged. And people think that on both sides. Uh, and our statistics don't paint a pretty picture either. In the 2016 presidential election, turnout was 60% nationwide. That means 40% of the eligible electorate didn't show up. In the 2018 midterms, we had 50% turnout, and that was a record. People were celebrating this amazing engaged citizenry, this engaged electorate. And I thought, half the people didn't show up, and we think that's a good idea? No, of course not. We can do better. We have to do better. In my state of Kentucky, I'm not from there originally, but I lived there nine years, and I know a lot about bourbon now, so I guess that counts. Uh, in my state, in, we had an election in 2015 to elect the governor, and turnout was 31%. That means that, you know, they won about half, 16% of the eligible electorate chose the governor. He's up for re-election this year, and we're expecting basically pretty low turnout as well. So this doesn't paint a pretty picture of the state of our democracy. And yet I still find good news. And the good news comes from what I call democracy champions. Everyday Americans who are working on democracy reform and actually finding success. And so yes, we have voter suppression and we need to fight back against all the, the abuses in the voting system. But we also have to go on the offense. And we have to promote positive voting rights reforms through individuals and through stories. And the book is really a book of stories, stories of engaging, inspiring, everyday Americans who are working to improve our voting process. And so tonight I thought I'd tell you three of the stories in the book, among many. Uh, I interviewed over 50 people and did a whole bunch of uh, additional research. Uh, so I'm just going to tell three stories of some of the good news, some of the successes in voting rights. And the first one comes from my state of Kentucky, and I'm not telling it because it's come from my state, but because I think it demonstrates a surprising positive story in a state that really should not be known and is not known for voting rights. And it has to do with felon disenfranchisement, or actually what I prefer to call felon reenfranchisement. So Kentucky is one of the worst states in the country for felon disenfranchisement. That is the practice of uh, to taking away the right to vote for people who have been convicted of a crime. And Kentucky is one of the four states that disenfranchise people for life. Well, it actually, it was four, and now we're down to two, because Florida voters passed a state constitutional amendment to reenfranchise 1.4 million returning citizens. Now the legislature is trying to push back by setting criteria, and it's going to make 
the effect of the law not as robust as it could be, but there's still thousands of newly eligible voters who can vote in Florida. And the Virginia governor, actually the past two governors, has been signing executive orders to reenfranchise thousands of people in that state. So we're down to Kentucky and Iowa as the, the, the final two states that disenfranchise felons for life. Now my story involves an individual by the name of West Powell. About 25 years ago, West was 18 years old and he made a dumb mistake. He stole an, uh, a radio from an auto salvage yard. Now he was caught, he was convicted of a felony. Actually he got probation initially, the felony was theft, and he got probation initially um, because of his first offense. He violated his probation because he came home late. His curfew was 10 p.m. He came home at 11 because the only job he could get made him work until 11 p.m. And his parole officer caught him coming home late. So he ended up spending about 11 months in jail. He got out and he said to himself, what are you doing? This isn't who you are, West, you're not a criminal. You need to clean things up. You need to change the course of your life. And he did. He tried to get a job. He had a hard time because you have to check the box saying you're a felon. So he opened just up his own computer repair shop, very successful computer repair shop. He met a woman and got married. He had five kids, four girls and a boy. He said that he always wanted a boy, but the four girls came first. What are you going to do? And yet, he said he couldn't really feel a part of his society any longer. He felt like he was not fully part of his democracy because he had lost his right to vote for life. Now, Deep Red Kentucky had had this policy for many years. It's a legacy of Jim Crow. It's really a racist policy. And uh, but yet, every year, there had been a proposal to allow some low-level felons to get an expungement of their records, to get the felony wiped out, which would restore your right to vote. It had never gone anywhere in the legislature, and why would 2015 be any different? Wes Powell was why 2015 was different. He went to testify before the Kentucky State Judiciary Committee, the, the committee that would consider the bill, and he told his story. He spoke for about four and a half minutes, kind of soft-spoken, uh, and he said, my name is Wes Powell. 25 years ago, I made a dumb mistake. And you know, I think I've paid for that mistake. I think I've paid four times over. What more? could you want me to do? Now, Wes has a big smile. Uh, I actually have a picture of him in the book. You know, I have kids, so I needed to put pictures in my book. Uh, and I, so I have a picture of Wes in the book. And you can see he just looks like he's a, he's a warm, kind of cuddly teddy bear type of personality, soft-spoken, as I mentioned. And yet, he said, I'm not really a full person anymore because my right to vote has been taken away forever. Now, in the room that day was a Republican state senator named Whitney Westerfield, kind of a pro-law and order uh, person. He ran, ran for Kentucky Attorney General on a, a crime, anti-crime platform. And he said he was opposed to an expungement bill. He said nothing would change his mind. They're criminals. They committed a crime. They violated the social contract. Why should they get any leniency? And then he listened to Wes Powell's story. And he said, you know, something just clicked. Something stirred inside of me inside of me. I understood I could put a face to the problem. I can put a name to the issue. And he changed his mind on the spot. And he actually, he said he was texting his fellow Republicans, his fellow legislators, and saying, we're going to get this bill done. And they did, on a bipartisan platform, passed a, a law to allow some low-level felons to get an expungement of their records, to wipe it out, to restart their lives, to get the right to vote back. And it passed on a bipartisan measure. And now thousands of Kentuckians can get their right to vote back. Now, it's not a perfect law. There's an administrative fee. It used to be $500. They just reduced it to $250. It should be nothing. It should be automatic. Uh, too few felonies count uh, in terms of what you're convicted of and whether you're eligible to get an expungement. But even still, thousands of Kentuckians are eligible to and have regained the right to vote, all because someone like Wes Powell decided to speak up and someone like Whitney Westerfield was willing to listen. Now imagine if we spread that kind of positive story and all of these different issues all over the country. Imagine the impact it could have. It's not the entrenched politicians who are going to do it themselves. It's everyday Americans telling their stories. And you know, my favorite part of the entire West Powell narrative is this. He did regain his right to vote back, and he hasn't missed an election since. Now, my second story comes from another unlikely place for voting rights, a place you wouldn't expect to have good news on the voting front, and that's Texas. Texas is one of some of the worst 
laws in the country when it comes to voting. It's got a strict photo identification requirement that disenfranchises people. Uh, and you can see the motivations behind that kind of a law. In Texas, your student-issued University of Texas ID does not count for voting, but your gun license does. Texas also has a 30-day restriction on, or 30-day requirement for registration, right? You can't register, if you're not registered within 30 days of election day, you're simply cut out. And what we know is that states with a requirement like that, a 30-day requirement or a 21-day requirement, have the worst turnout in the country. And the states with same-day registration, where you can register and vote at the same time at the polls, or automatic voter registration, which Washington has and was one of the early states to do so, uh, those states have the highest turnout. Of course, AVR, automatic voter registration, where the state automatically puts you on the rolls without you having to do anything. And the states with same-day registration, automatic voter registration, have the highest turnout. And the states with a 30-day registration requirement, that is, before, 30 days before the election, have the lowest turnout. And of course, this makes sense, right? Many people are not paying close attention, not realizing they have to be registered that early on, and come the weekend before the election, they want to vote, and they can't. They're cut out of the process, especially problematic also when it comes to primary elections. Well, Texas is on that worst 30-day requirement. But someone named Carlos Duarte said, you know, we're not going to be able to change the law here. The Republicans are not going to support it. But we can do something about our turnout and our registration rates with particular communities. So the chapter I talk about this is called, What Do Taco Trucks Have to Do with Voter Registration? And it's my, maybe one of my favorite chapter titles. Maybe it's just because I love tacos, which is true. Um, but I also think it's a really innovative, creative strategy. Here's what Carlos Duarte did. He was the director, the state director, of a group called Mi Familia Vota. And he decided to go into Latino areas of Houston and bring voter registration forms to taco trucks there. And he said to the taco truck owners, ask your customers if they're citizens, if they're registered, and give them the voter registration forms, just like Legal Women Voters and Fixed Democracy First have voter registration forms here. And this was wildly popular in these areas, almost shockingly so. Many of these people said that politicians had never really been to these areas of Houston. The election officials had not reached out to these areas. And yet, here was a, an example of just making it a little bit easier to participate by having voter registration forms available at taco trucks. In fact, on the day of the voter registration deadline, taco truck owners were calling Carlos Duarte and saying, please bring me more forms. I've run out because so many people, so many citizens are seeking them, are trying to become registered, are trying to become part of our political process. And does this work? Well, I'll ask you with some numbers. Turnout among Latino areas in Houston where he had gone and brought taco trucks went up in those uh, in those elections. So Texas still has low voter turnout, but if you look, dial down the numbers, look at the demographics, Latino turnout ticked up after he went to taco trucks and simply gave them forms to hand out. Another great example of an everyday American reaching out to voters, being, bringing them into our political process, going into communities. This is not a top-down thing. This is not the legislature passing a big law. Those things are important as well. But it really takes grassroots movements like this to go to voters where they are, bring them voter registration forms when they're buying a taco. Now, we can talk about other aspects of the voting process, including election day convenience, universal vote by mail, which you all have, uh, uh, disabled voters and the issues involving disabled voters, the adoption of rank choice voting in state and local elections. But I want to jump to the, my third story, which involves a structural aspect of our elections, and that's partisan gerrymandering. Now, we, partisan gerrymandering was in the news recently. Just last Thursday, the US Supreme Court issued what I think is a horrible decision that said the federal courts are not going to hear cases involving partisan gerrymandering. By the way, for those who are not familiar, gerrymandering is the practice of drawing district lines, and we have to do it every 10 years, to entrench those in power. So politicians typically will draw the district lines for Congress, state legislature, even city council, in such a way, and often kind of squiggly, strange lines, to choose their voters so that they can ensure re-election for their political party or for themselves. And so that's a bad decision that the US Supreme Court came down with. And I think it's really unfortunate. And yet, I still see good news. Some people say I'm too much of an optimist. But I still see good news. And this story involves Michigan 
and it involves a young woman named Katie Fahey. Now, Katie Fahey was 27, year old, 27 years old after the 2016 presidential election. She was working for the Michigan Recycling Coalition and didn't really have any political experience. But she was kind of fed up with the tone of dis discourse in our country right after that election. And on the Thursday after Election Day, after Donald Trump had won, she was upset not necessarily because of the outcome, but just because everything seemed so caustic, so vitriolic. And she said, you know, I can't handle it. Actually, she was really concerned about going to Thanksgiving dinner that year. You know, some of her family members, she said, voted for Donald Trump. Others had voted for Bernie Sanders in the primary, and they're just diametrically opposed. And she feared the Thanksgiving horror that would occur as they got into politics. And so she posted on Facebook on the Thursday after Election Day. Simple post. She said, hey, guys, I'm thinking of taking on gerrymandering in Michigan. Anyone want to join in? Smiley face. She said the smiley face was important to her post. And she kind of expected that some family members and friends would respond, and they'd all join an organization and try to do what they could about gerrymandering, although they didn't know what that would be. And a funny thing happened. Very few family members and friends actually responded to that post. But people started sharing it on their own walls. First a few, then a dozen, then a hundred, then a thousand. And people were contacting her and saying, yes, Katie, I want in. Tell me what to do. She gets started getting all of these message, messages. Yes, I'm in. She turned to her coworker at one point and said, uh, so I kind of posted this thing on Facebook, and now I'm getting all of these messages, and I don't know what to do about it. Like, what do we do? Like, well, how do I respond to these people? So they started a new organization. They called it Voters Not Politicians, which demonstrates the, the basic idea, right, that voters should be able to choose their politicians and not the other way around. The politicians should not be choosing their voters. And uh, she didn't, again, she didn't really know what to do with these messages, so she started a Google spreadsheet with names, locations, and anything else about what the people said. And what they decided to do was have town hall meetings all around the state. They did 30 some odd town halls in 30 days where they talked to voters. And they said, well, tell us what you think should go into redistricting, into drawing lines. Well, of course, many people can't answer that question. So she would say, well, tell me about how you define your neighborhood. Is it based on school board districts? Is it the county? Is it something else about your neighborhood? And they came up with an idea. And they said, you know, the legislature shouldn't be doing this. But the people understand what shouldn't be involved in a redistricting practice. So they crafted ballot language for a state constitutional amendment to change the Michigan Constitution to take the power to draw lines away from the legislature and put it with an independent redistricting commission. And she asked people, you know, who do you think should be on a re an independent commission? How many Democrats, how many Republicans, how many independents? Uh, how long should you have not be involved in politics to make, to make yourself eligible or actually ineligible to serve on a commission like this? And they got ballot language approved. Well, then they needed to get signatures. They needed hundreds of thousands of signatures. They needed to collect them all within about 90 days. Normally, this takes paid canvassers and a lot of money. They did it entirely with volunteers. They had people all over the state gathering signatures. They had people at rest stops in Michigan as people pulled off the road. And they said, man, when you come back from the bathroom, can we chat about the problem of gerrymandering and explain it to you? And Katie tried to use every volunteer that contacted her. So for example, one woman contacted her and said, I want to help, but I have no political experience. I know nothing about this. I, you know." You have my support, but I can't do anything. And Katie said, well, let's have a phone call. And just chat. And she, they got on the phone. She said, well, tell me just about yourself. Tell me what you like to do. And the woman said, well, actually, I'm a woodworker. I don't think that could help you, though, but that's my, that's my passion. And Katie said, actually, it can. Because at the time, they were trying to, make clip, trying to buy clipboards, large clipboards, with a demonstration of what a gerrymandered map looked like on the back. So they could, when they're talking to voters, they could get the signatures, and they could also say, well, let me show you. This is how weird lines look, and this is why it's a big problem. You know, you have these strange shapes, uh, and that leads to entrenchment, politicians drawing lines to make sure they can win re-election. And Katie said to the woman, do you think you could carve this kind of a map on a clipboard? And the woman said, yeah, sure, kid. sure I can. So they bought a bunch of wood, they trained people, and they actually carved hundreds of clipboards for their volunteers to have that uh, showed a gerrymandered map. And this cost, you know, it was going to be about $5 a pop for, for clipboards, and this cost less than a dollar each to do this. So she really used all of her volunteers in any capacity that they could. 
Now, it went to the ballot, and then they waged a vigorous campaign explaining to voters why this is necessary. And by the way, they had support of Democrats, Republicans, Independents, everyone in between, and that was very purposeful. They made sure to bring everyone, because you know, everyone but the entrenched politicians themselves understands why it's completely unfair to draw the lines to choose your own voters. Well, it went to the ballot in 2018, and it passed overwhelmingly. Over 60%, I think 65%, of Michigan voters enacted a new state constitutional amendment to take the power to draw lines away from politicians and put it with the voters. So now, in 2021, we have the new census coming up. There's not going to be a citizenship question on it that was just announced today, thanks to a Supreme Court decision. And then the Trump administration said we're not going to require the citizenship question, which is going to be very harmful. But even so, states that don't have an independent commission and have the politicians draw the lines are basically have free reign after the U.S. Supreme Court's decision last Thursday to gerrymander themselves in power. But in Michigan, which usually goes about 50-50, and yet Republicans in the last cycle were masterful at drawing a map that kept themselves in power, now they're not going to be able to do that anymore because of Katie Fahey posting on Facebook, and now it's going to be an independent commission. As she put it, we basically overthrew the government. I mean, peacefully, but we basically overthrew the government through this action. So these stories, these three stories, I think, epitomize something that runs throughout the book, which is that inspiring everyday Americans are at the forefront of democracy reform and on a whole slew of issues, whether it's lowering the voting age to 16 for local elections, which some places have done, whether it's uh, the registration aspects we talked about, disabled voters, ranked choice voting, uh, civics education, a very important part of this whole movement, and there's an entire chapter just on some of the amazing great things happening on civics education. We talked about gerrymandering, campaign finance, and I talk about Seattle a lot in the book, and it's great democracy vouchers program, which I'm sure most of you know about, and what a great model for the rest of the country for public financing to undo some of the harms of, for example, the Citizens United decision and other decisions. Uh, promoting and focusing on local journalism. All of these in combination are vital to improving our democracy and taking it to a place really it's never been before. You know, at the end of the book, I have a section called 90% turnout. And I say, why not 90%? Why not strive for something? Now, countries like Australia have mandatory voting, and their turnout is routinely 90, 95%. And people seem very educated, seem very happy with the system. I'm not. I don't think we could ever get to a universal voting model, or at least I'm skeptical of the politics behind that. But why not strive for something like 90%? I firmly believe that if we adopt all of the reforms in this book, then we can get to something like 90. And you know what? If we strive, we make that our goal. We're never going to get 100, right? Let's be a little realistic. So I say 90. If we strive for something like 90% and we hit, I don't know, 75, that's pretty darn good based on where we are, especially if we improve that in midterm elections and local elections, et cetera. Now, the book is a book of stories, as I've said, and it's a book of everyday Americans and democracy champions, and I hope people reading the book are inspired. I hope they get to the end and they think, yes, I can do something. In fact, I was so inspired. Every time I interviewed someone for this book, I rushed to my computer and just started to write more because I was so inspired by their stories. And so I hope that sense of inspiration, that sense of hope, rings through to the end of the book. But I want more than just people to feel good, right? It's nice to feel good about you know, what's possible. It's nice to understand it's not just doom and gloom out there. But I hope people take action as well. And that's why at the end of the book, I include an appendix. It has lists of all 50 states and organizations in each one working on issues of democracy reform. So for example, in the Washington section, Fix Democracy First is listed. The second half of the appendix has a listing of national organizations, including the League of Women Voters. Now, the League is, has you know, state chapters and local chapters. I decided to include it in the national section instead of trying to list every single uh, local chapter. And a handful of other, chapter, uh, other organizations, again, state-specific, and then in the back, issue-specific. So if you want to work on campaign finance and ranked choice voting or redistricting reform, you can find national organizations in the back of the appendix. Because here's what I hope. I hope people think, Yes, this is possible. Yes, we can make change. And yes, I can be involved. Can we all spend an hour a week on democracy reform? I think so. Because it's not going to come, as I already said, from the top. It's not going to come from entrenched politicians. They're winning under our current system. They have no incentive to change the rules of the game until they're forced to. And we get these local ideas, 
things like automatic voter registration, universal vote by mail, that start small, start in a particular locality, spread to statewide, and then spread throughout the country. So AVR, automatic voter registration, started in Oregon, moved to, and actually some localities had the idea of trying to do some of this first, but statewide was first in Oregon, moved to Washington. Now it's in places like Georgia and West Virginia, not necessarily blue, bast bastions of blue voters if we're going to talk politics, right? And now it's in over a dozen states with more on the way. Universal vote by mail, also known as vote at home, again started in Oregon, moved to Washington, now it's in Colorado. Utah had all but one county use it, and the last county finally said they're going to adopt it, so Utah's moving statewide, Hawaii is going to universal vote by mail, and a bunch of counties in other places. Um, ranked choice voting started at the local level first. And then in cities like San Francisco, Minneapolis, St. Paul, then spread to statewide in Maine, adopted it statewide. Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis once said that states can be laboratories of democracy, that one courageous state can try something new and then it can spread to other states. And I like to think that if states are laboratories of democracy, then cities and counties can be test tubes of democracy that try something out on an even smaller scale and then those can spread. So I hope you're inspired. I hope you know that change is possible, that positive change, not just fighting it back against the voter suppression, but real meaningful change to bring more people into our political process. You know, so the book is called Vote for Us, How to Take Back Our Elections and Change the Future of Voting. So that's a question. How do we take back our elections and change the future of voting? And without spoiling the whole book, I'm gonna answer it very briefly. I think it's West Powell who spoke up and changed minds in Kentucky about felon disenfranchisement. I think it's Carlos Duarte who decided to bring voter registration forms to taco trucks in Latino areas in Houston. I think it's Katie Fahey who just posted a simple Facebook post, uh, had a simple Facebook post and created a revolution in her state. I think it's me, I think it's them, I think it's you. Thank you. Yeah. What can we do on the state level to try to reverse Citizens United? Good question. So the question, if you couldn't hear, was what can you do at the state level to try to reverse Citizens United? My first answer to that question actually is that Citizens United itself is not as problematic, I think, than a prior case. 1973 U.S. Supreme Court case called Buckley versus Vallejo, which essentially held that spending money on elections is the same as speech, and so therefore gets robust fr uh, free speech protections. Um, Citizens United extended that principle to say corporations and unions have that same kind of First Amendment right. But the real problem is, should we even think of you know, me speaking at a bookstore and having the right to say whatever I want without the government saying I can't be the same as me spending money to give a candidate uh, or support a candidate. I don't think they're the same. And so the real question I think is more, what can we do to undo that mantra? Unfortunately, there's not much given the current Supreme Court. I mean, you know, and my buddy from, his, uh, from, from Kentucky, Mitch McConnell, has been masterful at, uh, he's not really my buddy, by the way, um, uh, has been masterful at, you know, essentially stealing the Supreme Court seat that Obama had open and, uh, and appointing Merrick Garland and, uh, and uh, stopping that from happening. And then we get Justice Gorsuch, we get Justice Kavanaugh. Um, and so you have a, a solid five justice majority who's going to continue to require the deregulation of campaign finance and fewer campaign fi finance regulations. So I think the solution, unfortunately, is to focus on what the Supreme Court is currently allowing, which is disclosure laws, and have more and ro more robust disclosure requirements so that anyone spending money on elections, including these dark money groups that are able to hide who they really are, hide who their donors are, and we can still, at least constitutionally, it hasn't been overruled yet, and I think it's unlikely to be, hopefully at least, require that disclosure. The other thing I think we can do, and again, it's been endorsed by the Supreme Court, is promote public financing in different forms. So we have public financing in Maine and that, that kind of model, as well as a whole bunch of cities. You have the democracy voucher uh, in a solution in Seattle, which is really working amazingly well. I saw some numbers a week or two ago that showed that money from outside of Seattle used to be about two thirds, or, or money spent in elections, in Seattle elections, used to be about two, come two thirds from outside the city. And that's now basically reversed. And now it's about two thirds from within side 
the city. Uh, so that's a great success story, even though it still has, I mean, it still has kinks to be worked out. I'm not saying it's perfect, but it has some, I think, real potential. And so, uh, Unfortunately, reversing Citizens United itself is probably not going to happen anytime soon, but I also don't think that should be the number one goal. Um, I think there are bigger problems and there are solutions that, are, uh, that can be tackled and have some success. What else? Yes? Is there any indication that vote by mail increases to voter turnout? Yeah. Good question. Thank you. Absolutely. It's actually phenomenal. I'm, I'm surprised by this. Many people uh, say to me, well, we should have early voting. And actually, the studies on early voting, you know, just having a longer election period, demonstrate that it only improves turnout by a tiny bit. Um, most people who use early voting were already going to vote on election day anyways. But universal vote by mail has improved turnout tremendously. Uh, let me tell you a quick story, by the way. Uh, when I first started teaching election law and, to my law school classes, and I would talk about different voting uh, possibilities, and I would tell them about Oregon, which was the first to, to adopt universal vote by mail, and I said, uh, you know, Oregon has this really interesting system where they have all male voting. And the women in the class looked at me like, what are you talking about? You know, like the 19th Amendment says women can vote in all male voting. And so I'm very careful now to say universal vote by mail. But actually, the better term for it is vote at home. Because although, <coughs> excuse me, it's universal ballot delivery, everyone receives their ballot in the mail, about half the people return it to a secure drop box and don't actually put it back in the mail to return it. But what do we see? The states with the highest turnouts have been uh, you know, a combination of states with universal vote by mail and same day voter registration or automatic voter registration. And so, you know, Washington has had good voter turnout in Oregon and Colorado. Um, Colorado actually has the best model because you can they have vote at not, you know, universal vote at home, but then if you want to go vote at a center on election day, they have vote centers. So instead of having to go to a home based precinct, you can go to any vote center in the county. And they're all connected, so if it's closer to home or closer to work or out, out doing errands or whatever, you can go to any vote center if you choose not to return your ballot in the mail. Um, I, I don't know the exact numbers, um, but you know, over 10% difference through universal vote by mail. The other thing is it actually improves turnout among minority communities. Uh, I think maybe a surprising result, um, but it's, pr it's been proven. So I'm on the advisory board for the National Vote at Home Coalition, which is promoting these policies uh, to more states because it works. And I have a whole chapter that talks about the history of that and the history of its adoption, uh, first adoption in Oregon. Yes? Is there a limit to numbers on the Supreme Court? Yeah, the question is, is there a lim limit to the number of Supreme Court justices? No, that's done by statute. Um, so Congress gets to dictate the number of Supreme Court justices. There is a movement right now, given what Mitch McConnell did, to, um, to increase the Supreme Court. I'm actually not a huge proponent of it because I think doing so as a kind of tit for tat really breaks down institutional norms even more. Now, we already have a failing of institutional norms, and uh, Mitch McConnell is, I think, obstructionist number one, and he's done a lot of that. Um, but you know, I mean, maybe my mom taught me two wrongs don't make a right, but uh, I'm not sure that uh, it's really best to fight fire with fire in that way, but instead do some of these other things that can have a huge influence. That said, what McConnell did is going to have an impact for decades, and it's, it's really unfortunate. Um, I actually wrote a, an op-ed for CNN.com about six months ago uh, after Mitch McConnell had blocked H.R. 1, the, uh, the Congressional For the People Act that has a lot of these ideas. And uh, it was actually, it was, it was as a letter, it said, Dear Senator McConnell, as a law professor at your alma mater, because he went to UK law, um, I, I encourage you to come sit in on my election law class. I think you can learn something. Uh, he hasn't responded yet. But, uh, but I do think he's been obstructionist, number one, and it's been really unfortunate. But I don't think, yes, Congress could do it. I don't think it's the right answer, though. Yes, in the back. Do you have a view on uh, the national elections and the voting machines versus paper ballot ballots? So it's kind of a two-part question. Yeah. The, our, some of our mistrust around the electronic voting machines. The second part is, is there any movement towards paper ballots or more capital <laughs> tracking? Yeah, so, uh, so on both questions, the answer is electronic-only voting machines are not the answer. 
Uh, and sometimes they get followed up with, like, you know, what about online voting? And absolutely not the answer. Uh, we need to have a paper trail. And that's one reason I think universal vote by mail actually is also another good system. And couple that with, a, what I believe you all have, it's something called ballot trace, where you can actually track your ballot through the system. And that's really great, right? So you know whether the ballot is has arrived, whether it's been processed, et cetera. Um, and so the movement is, is in many places to move, even if they don't have vote by mail, to move to uh, machines that have a paper trail as well. Um, now, Georgia's Secretary of State, uh, new, new elected, just moved to purchase some machines that are electronic only. Unfortunately, that there's a lot of pushback. I think uh, he went ahead and still did it, and I think it's really unfortunate. Um, absolutely, we need to have a paper trail. Um, I do think, however, that we can trust our systems with a paper trail. Uh, you know, people often have the concern about Russian hacking, and there was evidence that Russia hacked into voter registration databases, but the registration databases are kept separate from election results and, and the voting process. And so as long as we have a system that we can verify the paper ballots, uh, then I think there's nothing to be concerned about. In the states that have only, you know, it's weird, like where I vote in Kentucky, uh, we have only electronic only machines without a, a paper trail. And sometimes you have a close election and there'll be a runoff, or excuse me, a recount, but the recount's meaningless. You just press the button again, it gives you the same result. Um, and so, you know, unless the machine, you know, miscounted somehow or gives you a different count. So that's not a good system. We need to move towards more. Pennsylvania used to have a lot of places that had electronic only. They've now moved to having machines that at least have a paper recount. But the real solution is uh, vote at home or universal vote by mail. Yes? What about the Supreme Court term limit? Yeah, I think that's also a good idea. I talk about it very briefly in the book. Uh, Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, Supreme Court term limits is the question. You know, what about could we do Supreme term limits on the Supreme Court? Um, I think it's a good idea. There is a group uh, in, uh, that's uh, focused on this issue. The name of it is escaping me, but it's it's in the book, um, and it's uh, it's called. I'm sorry, it's not escaping me. It's called fix this court or fix the court. And the proposal is uh, for 18-year term limits. So essentially, each president would get to, to appoint two justices um, and a rotating. I think it's a good idea. Um, again, whether it's going to have any movement, um, you know, the book, I focus the book on practical reforms that are already being implemented in some places because I, what I want is readers to say, oh, it's working there, so it's not that radical to, to have it happen here. And all of the ideas here are seeing success, and I can point to actual successes in some of those, in, in all of these places to make the case for why it should be adopted in other places. 18-year uh, term limits is one of those sort of uh, kind of pie-in-the-sky ideas, which I think is a good idea, but I can't point to a success story, right, to say it's actually happened. Something I think is worthy of consideration, but it, it'll be a very heavy lift. Other questions? Paul Weirich, you know, is famous for his statement about goo-goo government, right? He said, uh, you know, good government, and uh, I don't want everybody to vote, right? And so... Uh, actually, what we're talking about actually is party, partisan, don't you think? Because if everybody could vote, and if there weren't gerrymandering and all that stuff, there would be a democratic majority. Maybe. So the question is, uh, essentially, is wanting everyone to vote just a partisan push to get Democrats in office more and get Democrats winning? Not necessarily. Um, you know, on some of these issues where we've had changes in the electoral structures, automatic voter registration, universal vote by mail, et cetera, uh, you don't see a major partisan change. You know, you see, I think, better elections, you see better candidates, you see better outcomes, but you don't see necessarily partisan changes. So that's one answer, right, is that I'm not sure the effects that people assume are really there. My second answer is, I don't care, and not I don't care because I want Democrats to win. I don't care because the strength of our democracy depends on more people participating. You know, Alexis de Tocqueville once said that a democracy is only legitimate based on the consent of the governed. Well, shouldn't we actually have the consent of the governed and not the consent of 31% of the governed? Um, so it doesn't, the partisan effects don't matter to me, whatever they may be, if we have stronger turnout that leads to better democracy. And I guess my third point would be, you know what, if you're so concerned about election outcomes and that's why you're opposing these ideas, instead of opposing them, why not reach out to these new voters? Why not change your message? You know, 
Uh, we can talk about any, any number of these that are attended to increase who's eligible to vote or who can participate, felon reenfranchisement or what have you. You know, these are a crop of new voters that you can send your message to and explain why your message is the better message. And that's the answer, right? Not to be undemocratic, which is essentially what Mitch McConnell has been by obstructing the For the People Act, H.R. 1, by, you know, uh, uh, essentially stealing the Supreme Court seat. It's not undemocratic in the, in the Democratic Party sense of the word. It's just anti-democracy. And let the chips fall the way they may. You know, shouldn't the best ideas and the best candidates win out and not who can vote and not election rules? That's the number one goal. So I don't care. It's not, it doesn't have the effect that many people, it doesn't always necessarily, at least not, doesn't uh, absolutely lead to that effect. And why not change your message or reach out to uh, these new voters? Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, good. So the question is about the Electoral College. Um, so I do think the Electoral College is in many ways undemocratic. Maybe it had a purpose at our founding when we were a very different country uh, with very different communication, very different um, campaigns. It doesn't make any sense now, right? The, we elect the president in a nationwide election. Uh, why should we be you know, having this kind of weird state-by-state -state system that really skews in favor of the rural states. Um, that said, so there's a movement to change the Electoral College. Uh, you need either a constitutional amendment or a workaround. And the workaround is the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact, which Washington State is a member of. And essentially, what that says is that states, you know, under the Constitution, states can award the Electoral College votes to whoever, however they want and whoever they want. And so what this compact says, essentially, is that instead of giving our electoral college votes to the statewide winner, we'll give them to whoever wins the country. So in Washington, let's say the state, uh, statewide, the Democratic nominee wins, but nationwide, the Republican gets the most, elect, um, the, the most in the popular vote. Washington would award its electoral college votes to that Republican. Now, the, the uh, plan doesn't take effect until enough states have passed it to equal 270 electoral college votes, which is the number needed to win the presidency. Um, and it's passed in about a dozen states or so, equaling something like around 190 electoral college votes now. So they're well on their way. I don't think it'll actually get passed enough places until or if we have a, a situation where a Republican wins the popular vote but loses the electoral college. And that almost happened in 2004. In fact, if John Kerry had won Ohio, he would have won the Electoral College, and he lost it by about 150 some odd thousand votes. If he had won Ohio, he would have won the Electoral College, but not the popular vote. And I think if that had happened two years in a row, 2000, 2004, but opposite parties, there would have been a lot more movement. Um, now, once it does pass, I'm also skeptical of, about its constitutionality. Uh, so it will be challenged in the courts, and I think there are two strong, I don't know if they're, they're winning, but I think there are two strong constitutional arguments against it. One is that it's clearly an end run around the U.S. Constitution. The Constitution sets out the Electoral College. Now, it does say states can award their Electoral College votes however they want, but it also says, and here's the Electoral College, and the plan is clearly an end run around that. The second problem is that the Constitution says states can't enter, in, can't enter into compacts with each other without congressional approval. And this is called the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. So, you know, the name doesn't help. Now, the state's argument would be, well, we're all just, um, we're all doing this kind of simultaneously, but there's no agreement, there's no exchange of things between states, and that's really what that compact clause means. But it is, you know, kind of, it's called the compact. So, and under, you know, under this current conservative Supreme Court, I'm skeptical about whether it even passed constitutionality, constitutionally. Now, again, I think it's a good idea to push it. You know, what's the worst case is we're in the same position we were previously, but uh, otherwise, we really need a constitutional amendment, and that may require having a, a Republican uh, win the popular vote, but not the Electoral College. Other questions? It's a little bit removed, but what about the discussion of expanding the House of Representatives, the number of representatives? Yeah, there was actually a lawsuit that um, was filed saying that the current composition of the House of Representatives at 435 is unconstitutional and using some kind of somewhat, I think, strange arguments, um, and the courts have rejected it. Uh, I, not surprisingly so. Um, you know, 435 is already a pretty big number and they can't get much done. I'm not sure that uh, a huge more, a number more would actually help that problem. You know, they can barely keep the lights on. So I'm not so sure. I do think a proposed law called the um, Fair Representation Act 
uh, would be a good idea. Um, so this law would change. So right now we have single member districts. So each small district elects one member of Congress. And that would change. Instead, you'd have larger districts in each state. And each state would elect multiple, each district would elect multiple members. So let's say, you know, say like Washington might be split into four and then with multiple members in each district. And you would elect them using ranked choice voting. Uh, and I can explain ranked choice voting in a moment for those who don't know. I think that system would make a lot of sense um, because it would, uh, you know, ranked choice voting in general is helpful. The problem with, with single member districts is that you can win with, you know, 40% of the vote or something. Uh, and it also leads to the primaries being the thing that really matters in so-called safe districts, right? If you're a, a strongly Democratic or strongly Republican district, it's the primary that makes the biggest difference. And only strong partisans, not only, mostly strong partisans vote in the primary. So you, that's why you get these polarized um, uh, nominees. Now you get these Tea Party nominees and these you know, super liberal nominees on both sides, again, because it's the primaries that make the biggest difference. If we had larger districts, multi-member districts with ranked choice voting, that would make a lot of sense. Um, ranked choice voting, by the way, for those, and people want me to explain it real quick. Um, so it's a different voting system. Instead of electing just one candidate among many, uh, you can rank order your preferences. You know, I like this person first, this person second, this person third. And, you know, we all have preferences in our daily lives. In fact, on the chapter on ranked choice voting, I, uh, I explain, I note that, you know, I love ice cream, um, and my favorite flavor is mint chocolate chip. But if I go to the ice cream shop and mint chocolate chip's not there, they're, they're out of it, I don't just turn around and not have ice cream. That's crazy, right? No, I go to my second choice. We all have preferences. So imagine, if you will, a big election where, I don't know, there's maybe 24 uh, candidates running for a big office, right? And you have to choose one if you're among that political party. I'm just making this up, but, uh, oh, I, you know, actually, I should, I should make a big announcement tonight. You know, my family's here, they're in the back. Um, and so my intentions for 2020, I've got a, a big announcement. I'm not running for president. My, my wife just breathed a big sigh of relief. I didn't make the debate, so, you know. Um, anyways, so imagine you have a situation where uh, you have multiple candidates and you can only choose one. Well, in ranked choice voting, you can say, I like this person first, this pe person second, this person third. Um, and then the ranking system takes into account. Essentially, if you have the person who came in last, who got the fewest first place votes, they're eliminated, and the person's second choice counts instead. So imagine you have a table in front of you, and you get all the ballots, they're ranked ordered, and you put, put them in piles based on the first choice, first place vote. So you have you know, this many for this person, this many for this, this, this many for this person. Find this, see if one, one pile has 50% of the ballots. If they do, that's the winner because it, that person is preferred by 50% of the voters. If not, you look for the smallest pile. Take that smallest pile, that candidate's eliminated, and you reallocate their votes based on the second choice. And then you see what the smallest pile is. You pick up the smallest pile, reallocate the net, and maybe the third choice at that point, if the, the top two have been eliminated. You keep doing that until you have one pile that's got 50% of the votes. That is your winner. And ranked choice voting is a lot of promise. Again, it started the modern era. Actually, we used to use it in places like Cincinnati uh, 50 years ago. But the modern era uh, began in San Francisco in 2002, th in large part thanks to an innovative guy named Stephen Hill, who would go to bars in town and say, hey, let's you know, get the attention of the crowd and say, hey, let's all rank order our favorite beers to kind of show people how simple it was. And San Francisco passed it and moved to places like Minneapolis and St. Paul. Um, Maine has used it for congressional elections. It's about to be implemented in Memphis. Nashville is considering, and a handful of others as well. And this really changes elections in these places. It improves turnout. Because people understand that no longer are you throwing your vote, throwing away your vote, or your vote doesn't matter. You know, if you like a third-party candidate, vote your, your true preferences. Um, it also makes campaigns a lot more positive. Because if you're running against you know, one opponent or you know, there's kind of one primary person, you're going to throw as much mud as you can at that person, right, to try to drive down turnout. In a ranked choice voting system, you're going to go to those people, the, the supporters of that opponent, and say, hey, I'd like you for you to put me as first. But if I understand you might like, like that other guy better. And if you do, if you insist on that, can you at least put me second? Because that might make a difference. So you're less likely to go negative. And that's what we've seen in these elections that have it. The campaigns are a lot more substantive. They're a lot more positive. The voters love it. The candidates love it. So that's a long-winded answer to the question about uh, increasing the House of Representatives. I think that system would make a lot more sense. Yeah. You mentioned about how some race people are determining their primary. Well, Washington has a top two primary, which it seems to me would tend to favor the less extreme candidate of either party. I've heard that that's not the case. It seems to me it's happened here in our fourth district. What do you think about that as a mechanism, and what have you seen the results of? 
So the question is, uh, you know, you all have the top two system where everyone runs in the primary and the top two vote recipients move on to a runoff uh, election. And the question is sort of, does that lead to less extreme candidates winning or how is the effect of that? I think it really depends on the area. Here's the concern about a top two system. Let's imagine in a primary, you've got in a, a heavily, let's say heavily Democratic district, you have 10, uh, 10 Democrats run and two Republicans. So 12 candidates, right? The concern is those 10 Democrats are gonna split their votes. And the two Republicans, maybe they're only gonna get between them 30%, but they're gonna come out as the top two. And so then you have a situation where your runoff is between two candidates that 70% of the electorate didn't vote for because the Democrats all split. And it became very close in California to that actually happening. And there was a lot of concern among the Democratic Party in California of electing you know, basically having two Republicans move to the runoff in several of those congressional elections. It didn't happen, but it, it came close. It happened here with our treasurer. So, okay, so there you go. So it did happen here. I didn't know that. So I, I, I have some concern. I think top two is better than a purely polarized primary. And I think it's better certainly than a closed primary. That is a primary where you have to be registered with the political party to vote in that primary. That really does lead to polarized nominees on both sides. Um, top two is maybe better than that. But I think ranked choice voting is even way better than top two, again, because of the, the potential of having two nominees of the same party who actually are in a, in a minority. And it can happen, you know, Louisiana has a top two as well, and it can happen on the other side in Louisiana. So, uh, again, that's not a partisan statement. Go ahead. You have a question? Um, yeah. Like in the primary in California, uh, they had such a skewed system that uh, if you were a independent voter, you had to get a special ballot, right, to vote independent, and they didn't really tell anybody that. Yeah. So all those people that really were favoring Bernie, uh, not all of them, but lots, got cut out of the picture. Yeah. So Well, and, and the, the, the problem in some ways happens on the other side. New York has a closed primary, and uh, Donald Trump's children couldn't vote for him in the primary because they didn't register in time. Uh, as a member of the Republican Party. Uh, so, you know, it, it's a, it's a, a, a multi-partisan problem. Again, I think, you know, open primaries are better than closed primaries, but ultimately I think ranked choice voting is an answer to that issue as well, uh, as, as well as, the, you know, the, the problem. So I had a piece recently on CNN, CNN uh, that called for the Democratic Party, instead of having these debate rules, it's going to cut people out of the debates. You know, they're going from 20 to, I think it's 10, uh, for the second debate based on number of uh, both polling data and number of donations you've received. And you know that lets the elite decide you know, who gets to stay on the debate stage, which makes a big difference. Why not use ranked choice voting instead uh, to whittle out the candidates? I think that makes a lot more sense and that would be uh, a solution uh, as well. Um, other questions? You know, one thing I wanna highlight, by the way, I saw a lot of nods when I mentioned it, and so I just to highlight it briefly and then probably time for just one more uh, question if there's any left is the civics education chapter. Because uh, this is something that not a lot of people talk about, I think, but is vitally important to the process of democracy reform. And that is improving civics education. Now, when I set out to write that chapter, I expected to learn that citizenship or civics education was basically dead, right? There wasn't much going on anymore, and what little was left was learning kind of the boring checks and balances uh, and the three branches of government. You know, as a constitutional law professor, I find that interesting, but most 16-year-olds don't. Uh, and so I was actually really surprised and inspired to learn about some great things happening in the world of civics education, I interviewed these amazing teachers who were uh, doing project-based learning, what they call action civics, where, so I talked about this woman, Jen Hitchcock in Virginia, a social studies teacher, who engages her students in actual real-world problems and debates. So she had them read the Supreme Court's voter ID decision and then had them write policy position, research it, and then write policy position papers on both sides so they can understand how to make arguments on both sides. She graded them not on how they came out, but on just how the quality of their arguments for each side. Um, and, you know, it's amazing. She brought candidates into the, uh, the schools. Uh, you know, you have the situations where I, uh, there's a school in Washington, D.C., a public magnet school, so it draws from all over the city, where the social studies teacher there said to his class, hey, let's, let's tackle a real-world problem that you all face. So they talked about it, and they just realized that tardiness among their fellow classmates was a big problem. So they researched, figured out why. It turns out public or 
transportation in general was just not reliable for many of these students coming from all over the city. So they came up with a plan. They went to the DC City Council and convinced them to allow students in DC to ride public transportation for free. So now DC uh, kids, uh, either public or private school, now it's expanded to private school students as well, can get a kids ride free card that lets them use public transportation. Anyone think those students will ever forget the importance of engaging in their democracy? So we can't just focus on let's teach the facts and rote memorization. There's a movement to like make a high school graduation requirement just learning the citizenship test that new citizenships have to pass. And that's, I guess, fine, but that can't be what we do and the only thing we do because that's rote memorization. And we can do this all the way down to the elementary school level. My wife's a school, elementary school teacher. She had her students write a letter to Donald Trump after his election explaining their concerns and their hopes for the future and the things they dealt with in their own communities and wrote this amazing, beautiful letter. Sadly, he didn't respond. So we need to make sure we hold our elected uh, officials accountable. But we can engage people all the way down from elementary school all the way up through high school and beyond. This is not... Uh, a K through 12 problem. It's a, a pro uh, something that we can do throughout adulthood, and there's some great stories of things happening. I think we have time for one more question, if there is one. No? Well, then, let me just conclude by saying that it's been such a pleasure to be able to go around the country and speak with people about this book. Again, I was so inspired to write it. You know, when I was looking for a publisher, I got a bunch of rejections at first because I said, well, you know, doom and gloom sells. And your book is too positive. It's too, too uh, anti-doom and gloom. And my answer was, yes, it is, right? But I think people do want those good stories. And, and what I've learned traveling around the country and speaking with groups like you all is that people are clamoring for that good news because they want some direction. You know, it's, it's one thing to post on Facebook that you're upset about the latest tweet that our elected officials uh, have or, or the latest injustice. And, and it's good to protest, and it's, you know, people wear red for ed to support teachers, and all that stuff is great. But I think we can go beyond that. And I think that the everyday Americans in the book and everyday Americans like you all are the keys to that success. And I think it's groups like Fix Democracy First and the League of Women Voters that are really the keys to moving our democracy forward. We can change this. It's not all doom and gloom out there. I'm inspired. I'm inspired by having such a great group come out on a uh, Tuesday evening. We're on Tuesday, right? A Tuesday evening uh, to talk about voting rights. I'm so inspired to see that. Uh, and, and I just want to thank you uh, so much for giving me the chance to spread this message, which I think is so important to me. It's important to me. It's not my stories. It's everyone's stories. It's your stories because ultimately this is about fixing our democracy. It can happen. It is happening. And it will happen. Thank you all so much.